My mother always said, don't forget we're Irish. She said that to me so often, you know. And then I married a French Canadian, which she wasn't happy about that. She said, when we brought you to Canada, we never thought you'd marry a foreigner. Like his family had been 200 and odd years, 50 years here. We'd been, what, not even 18 at the point. So my mother was um, very staunchly Irish in a sense, but she was from Liverpool, but she was Irish, you know. And uh, so it meant a lot to me, first of all, because of her. And then uh, when I was in my uh, 30s, I took a course in Irish. I used to think all my grandparents, great-grandparents rather, some of them may have spoken Irish, the ones in Galway or Kinsale or Mullingar, I don't know. And so I, um, I took a course in Irish at RTU and then I went to Donegal for a month to live in with a family in the Gaeltacht. And that was really the, the key moment, I think, that turned me into an Irish I don't even know whether to say Canadian. It's really funny because I became so Irish, probably, as I say, more than the Irish when something happens, you know. And I can remember being in Dublin, getting into a taxi. This is my first time ever in Ireland. I'm 30 something. And the taxi driver starts talking to me about how much he didn't like tourists. And I thought, he's telling me this. So he doesn't think I'm not Irish. So I was delighted. <laughs> and that was another moment that I'll, I'll never forget. We're Liverpool Irish, we came from, and we came on the Samaria, and it, it went to Pier 21, but for some reason we didn't get off, I don't know why, and we went on to uh, New York, to Ellis Island. But the biggest memory on the ship is I had my teddy bear with me, and my, um, my teddy bear meant a lot to me because my auntie Josie, she had two boys and, and I was about four and this is in Liverpool and they were pl using the teddy as a football and I saw this poor you know dilapidated teddy no eyes no fur and I went to Auntie Josie and I said they're using that teddy as a football and she said Pat would you like to have it I said oh I would love to have it and I took Teddy home and looked after him. So he was, I'm an only child, so he was my brother, you know. <laughs> and on the ship, um, my dad at one point held him over the side of the boat and said, Pat, what would you do if I dropped him? I think I nearly had a heart attack at nine years of age. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it, it's a permanent loan and my daughter can decide, but I've lent Teddy to him and they love him and the children who come read my story and they're all uh, delighted to, to meet Teddy. And being Irish to me, um, to me it's, it gives me a family here in Canada because I belong to the Irish Senior Social Group and they, for me, if I didn't have them, because I, you have your children and you have grandchildren, but it, you need a more constant uh, family to be in touch with and um, I think that that is just a wonderful thing. There's this, there's something you cannot explain it. You're just you're like each other. You, you sort of know how to finish other people's sentences. You just feel um, so at home with them, and I think that's what partly what the Irish means to me. All right. Well, that was the wonderful Pat Marshall um, with her harp, her singing, and her wonderful story of Irish heritage, and she touched on a, a lot of themes there. Um, so she starts off our uh, Irish Heritage Month celebration today. I am joined by James Maloney, MP. James, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. And happy Irish Heritage Month. And what a great initiative you uh, launched a couple of years ago. What is, is this year three, I think, now, is it? This, this is uh, year three. It's the, the second full year, but it's the third year. That's right. Yeah, and I think we should... Uh, you know, it's, it's the first full year in the sense that we're out of the pandemic, but I think we have to register the fact that the pandemic you know, did a lot of uh, damage to Irish organizations uh, in Canada and around the world, you know, with, with the lack of meetings and, and a fall off in, in activities and so on. So I think it's going to take a while to recover, but I think we should we should give them a shout out to all of those people out there who are reviving Irish organizations and re-engaging again. Uh, it really is the backbone of, of Irish heritage uh, for March and, 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 and all year round. Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the winter of... Uh... 2021 was really tough uh you know when the motion passed in march everything was shut down and mm -hmm. uh, people were celebrating from the confines of their homes last year it was a bit of a a mixture but you're so you're right this is the first year where everybody's out and about and able to do things 
in the fashion which they uh, are accustomed to doing and want to do it. And you're seeing that. You're seeing all of these organizations sort of get up and running again. But they did. It was a tough time. But it's uh, as you can see, they're they're getting back on their feet and they're moving forward with great zeal. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So for this Heritage uh, Month of 2023, uh, we're launching uh, 50 Irish Lives in Canada. Um, and I think it's it's been a really fascinating discovery, actually, of, of our heritage, because the more you look, the more you find. Um, and when we began this over a year ago, uh, we weren't sure what we were doing, um, but we rapidly came to a couple of conclusions. One, that we would have to confine the list to people who are born in Ireland, because there are just, just so many, uh, you know, C Canadians of first and second and third generation. Uh, who have made an impact here and helped build society. Um, I think uh, one of the other conditions was you have to be deceased, which I think <laughs> saves a lot of arguments. Um, <laughs> and then I think the other really important point was that we wanted to embrace all types of lives lived, as it were, not just those who made an impact, but everybody. Because at the end of the day, societies are not built by leaders. Leaders come out of strong communities and, and people living regular lives, raising families and, 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 and uh, earning their bread and so on, you know. So um, you've had a chance to, to, to read some of these, uh, James. What's your overall impression? Well, it's, I'm, I'm absolutely, uh, I'm, it's, it's an incredible series of stories. I mean, when the motion was passed, and you've heard me say this before, you know, Irish Canadians or Canadians with Irish descent have their fingerprints on everything in Canada. Well, this is proof. This is proof. You know, I, I said, I said that, uh, with a, a notional understanding that I was right, but here's the evidence. I mean, if you look over my shoulder here, that, that is a commemorative stamp of the 1972 <clears throat> Canada, Russia hockey summit series, which in Canada was one of the biggest events in my lifetime. Legend. I didn't know. I didn't know until I read these stories, there was Irish fingerprints on that. The government mm -hmm. of Canada appointed, uh, uh, Mr. Reed to be the re person responsible for overseeing it. Um, yeah. So there's just another example, and there's countless, countless examples. So it's yeah, yeah. And Paddy Reed, of course, led led the team that created the Canadian flag. Right, uh, that's right. Know, it's got an Irish fingerprint somewhere in a corner there. That flag, you know, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And there's and there's all kinds of stories like that. They they go on and on and on. So there is literally finger, you know, governors general, um, the TTC in the city of Toronto. Was, mm -hmm. was was it was sold to them by uh, an Irishman? I mean, I, all yeah. of these stories I wasn't aware of, so it's, it's just tremendous, and I look forward to reading them again and reading more as they come along. Yeah, I and mean, we've had great support from our historians. Uh, you know, Mark McGowan has been absolutely terrific. Um, he's uh, he's a very passionate supporter of this. He's he's got clearly a fantastic overview of the story of the Irish. Uh, in Canada, having written so extensively on it, including his most recent book, uh, The Imperial Irish, but also The Waning of the Green. Uh, David Wilson is, is a keen supporter as well and a contributor, and he's just published his book on on the, the Fenian raids from the United States into Canada, the, yeah. the Canadian spy story. Uh, Elizabeth was brilliant on the, on, on the role of women and women religious, you know, and that's one of the points I think we also discovered um, that the historical record as well as the historical experience uh, anonymized and, and rubbed out women from the record. Right. So we have a deficit there, but hopefully in the public call for papers, we'll, we'll get, we'll get more women and try to rectify the, um, uh, the gender balance on it. Um, the other thing, which I think we, we have to, and which has kind of guided us is this notion that it's complicated. This is not a simple story. This is a very complicated story of, a colonized Ireland being part of a colonization process here, you know, and it's, and you can't, you, it's not that you can say, oh, you know, there's no blame here. People are making often desperate decisions in desperate circumstances to, to survive, you know? So by saying it's complicated, we're also saying you can't really second guess what this story is, um, that it's complication is kind of its richness too. Well, it's, it's a story of, uh, it's complicated. You're right, but it's complicated because you think about at the time it was the it was the evolution, the beginnings of Canada, and mm -hmm. these these stories are part of that foundation. So people were coming to a a, a new place, uh, you know, not knowing necessarily what they were going to be getting into, and they had to evolve and adapt and bring their own experience. And that's 
it's the story of Canada. And if you look at if you look at Darcy McGee's words mm. pre-Confederation, um, he's he's envisioning a country. You could take those words and put them into a speech now, and it's exactly the same discussion. I mean, mm. but it was it was based on that background that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, one of the one of the foundational figures that that really began set Canada on its road to become a society that respected diversity was one of his one of his dreams and and rights for minorities as well. Um, the other uh, the other part of this, of course, is the story of the indigenous. And if there is a villain of the piece, it's Nicholas Flood Davin. You know, he's, mm. he's a home rule supporter. He's a fervent Irish nationalist. He supports women's rights. But he's given a job uh, to, yeah. to to address, quote unquote, the Indian issue and comes back and writes the report that establishes the, the Indian residential school system. But again, we have to we have to embrace that. That's just part of what this story is about and, and, and of, you know, intentions and ambitions and, and but awful things flowing from it. But at the same time, Marcus discovered some stuff that we reveal about um, the indigenous finding a common humanity with the Irish, particularly during the Great Famine. Um, and no matter how poor they were, they were fundraising for the Irish. So there's a there's a resonance there too with the with the indigenous experience, obviously. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, look, you, history isn't just a uh, a reflection of good stories. You have to take the good with the bad, and the and the residential school piece is definitely in that category. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's part of the story that needs to be told, and it's a it's a lesson we've learned from. Um, but it's part of the Canadian history. Um, but the indigenous piece, that's another that's another one that's um, got to be filled in a little bit because it's it's harder to source out the the records on that. But there is there is a, definitely a connection between uh, the experience of indigenous Canadians and uh, Irish immigrants to Canada. My Irish heritage and why it's so important. What does it make me feel? It makes me feel incredibly proud. It makes me proud of where I come from, it makes me proud of my family, it makes me think of my father, it makes me think of my mother, it makes me think of my two brothers, it thinks, makes me think about our ancestry here in Canada. It makes me think about Canada actually, because if you go across this beautiful country of ours, you see Irish fingerprints everywhere, every town, every city, every village, every piece of infrastructure. So pride is, really the most important thing. And when I think of my Irish heritage, I think of the pride of my family. And I think of how proud I am to be Canadian because Canada is truly a multicultural country, which means I'm proud to be Canadian and I'm incredibly proud of my Irish ancestry. You know, one of the things that we launched as part of this to kind of give it a current uh, and contemporary resonance is you know, the question, what does your Irish heritage mean to you? And 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 and, and you, we just heard you speak eloquently about that. And we, we got some responses on Twitter and, and social media. And it's it's funny the words keep coming up again that it that it's not this is not just history. This is for Irish people, their heritage is very living. It's living in, you know, uh music and culture. Um, one of the words that keeps coming up is that sense of community and kinship. That when yeah. they think about it, they 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 feel connected. I think is the word they feel. They they feel connected to history, but they feel connected to their own life. You know, by looking at the history, by by traveling to Ireland and finding their their ancestral roots, it's it's that funny sense of community. You know, Pat spoke about it too. You know, so uh, yeah, go ahead. You're right. I mean, it's it's um, that's why the, the fifty Irish lives and the Irish Heritage Month. It's it's encouraging people to explore explore their own history uh, and you know myself i'm an example of so many canadians they're proud of their irish heritage for reasons that they can't always put into words properly but this exercise of you know looking into your own family history or looking into irish canadian history uh is helping you know uh, find deeper meaning to what that is and i know mm -hmm. that's been my experience and reading these stories and knowing my own story about where my family settled in Canada. Uh, but there's, there's things that I was surrounded by uh, that I wasn't even aware of the Irish connection. Yeah. So it's, it has deep meaning to so many people, but I think the importance of this discussion, the importance of why we're having this talk right now 
and the 50 Irish Lives and all of these other initiatives, it's forcing people to think about their own history and to learn more about their own history. And they're going to be, they're all going to be very pleased with what they find. I should also mention, of course, that this all started with um, the Royal Irish Academy's publication of um, Irish Lives in America, and they've been a, right. they've been a support and a, and a source of advice for us too. So it's nice to see that we're able to to tell our story and actually do it pretty pretty promptly. You know, uh, thanks to the the passion of the contributors, um, uh, we've re- we've already got enough profiles to do one every day this month. And uh, I think if 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 our ambi- our ambitions are realised, we, we should be able to get to a publication. Um, I'd love to have it published in time for uh, Christmas presents, but we'll but we'll see. But it's certainly it's certainly on course for that. Inspiration for this came from a lot of places, but I just want to say thank you to you because you're the one who's pulled all this together. You're the one that took this idea and ran with it, mm-hmm. and. You know the, the Irish heritage. You're trying. I'm trying to figure out where this goes, how you how you make this happen, how you make it real for people, and this is doing it. So, uh, great credit to you, and you have my gratitude. Uh, and anybody who reads this uh, in the future is going to feel the same way. So, very very grateful to you. Well, it's like all these these things that they they get an energy because people are you know touches them in a way, and and they want to contribute, and that's always great. So it's. I'm 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 kind of riding the energy of all of these people, but we're all heading in the same direction, and and that's why I think this project is so exciting, and uh, and I think it makes makes history accessible as well, you know, yeah. because it's such a vast story. You think about the Irish coming here for three hundred years, and so many different phases, and it is so complicated. But if you pick an individual life and read it today, you just get insights all the time into these people, you know. So it collectively i think it tells an epic story but individually it's, it's very real you know and... oh it's it's very real i mean you, you read through these stories i i know myself when i'm there's places i'm going to go now which i've been to many times before but the next time i go i'm going to be looking at it differently because i i have a different appreciation of it you know taking the subway for example yeah next time exactly. i get on the subway with somebody i'm going to say you know it was an irish guy that created this thing right <laughs> People are going to get sick of hearing that. Yeah, they, yeah, I know. Believe me, I know. I get, I've been told to. I've been, I've been told to keep quiet, but you know, yeah. it's, it's irresistible. You know. So, in response to the question we put out there on what does my Irish heritage mean to me, uh, we got some really interesting responses, and I think we'll we'll read out a couple. You have one there, James. I do. This is the first one. Uh, My Irish heritage gives me a sense of belonging. Every Irish community around the world is different, and each diaspora brings to the table a new and exciting connection to what Irish culture means in our own local context. We all have a different degree of curiosity when it comes to interacting with our heritage. My Irish heritage growing up in Montreal has been rooted in traditions such as the St. Patrick's Day parades and the commemorations such as the annual Walk to the Stone or knowledge through my classes at the School of Irish Studies at Concordia. This March, I will represent my Irish Montreal community and wear my heritage with pride as I dance through the streets as queen of the 198th parade. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think she, she captures there the uh, the importance of the parade. I Does mean, she ever? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that the parade is really, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's pride, you know, it's, it, and it's been a manifestation of pride for hundreds of years, including in Canada and Montreal, I think one of the oldest St. Patrick's Day parades. Montreal is one of the oldest St. Patrick's yeah. Day parades. And yeah. you talk to people in the Irish community, everybody is aware of it. Everybody's proud of it. Everybody looks forward to it. Yeah. I have one here that says, being hyphenated as Irish Canadian puts me into, into community with millions of people, colonized people laboring to re- rebuild our cultures, as well as colonial people navigating our responsibilities to the community. I think we're at a wonderful moment where Irish Canadians can draw on the wealth of our stories, music, pain, dance, culture to improve that it isn't for simple remembering we are the diaspora here and now and we can build on what we want our culture to become uh what a joyful responsibility i think that's also right it captures irish culture is very dynamic you look at irish music it's it's constantly creating it's not some ossified culture in a museum it's actually living and borrowing and, and recreating itself which is wonderful you well, know that's right there, james. sorry james yeah it, well i was gonna say and, and the emphasis on the hyphenated irish canadian i mean that yeah. that that hits the chord right on too, because a lot of people feel that way. They're they're proud of both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. there's another one here. It's another good one. It's it means being an active ally to the indigenous peoples 
whose land we're on, remembering our own peoples and countries' struggles for independence and decolonialization and working together towards sovereignty for all of us. That's a powerful message. Yeah, that's wonderful. Isn't sovereignty for all of us, but also making that connection about how we're we're not just trapped by history if we understand that we can manage our way forward in a sense, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the deconflicting. It's working together and and yeah, you know, recognizing yeah. our common struggles. All right, here's another one. Starts hmm means he was thinking about it. Yeah. I was born and brought up in the Ulster, Ulster Scots bubble of North Antrim. So my identity is complex. I want to feel more connected to Ireland, but I'm viewed as not Irish enough for that. This creates understandable glass walls, particularly in Vancouver. That was Philip Cochran. Yeah, well, you know, I would say Philip embraces Ulster Scots uh, means Irish. They are absolutely Irish. Yeah. They were there for generations. Um, and I don't think anybody should sh be shy about embracing the, their own particular version of Irish identity. If, one, if there's one thing that the 50 Irish lives shows us over 300 years, Irish identity is, is, is it's, it's, it's multifaceted. It changes from one generation to the next. Everybody's got their own grasp on it. And I think we, and, and Ireland has gone through this too. We're, we're much more open to embracing all forms of Irish identity. So wear your Irish badge with, with pride is what I would say. I have a nice uh, quick one here. It means everything. Well, that probably we should just go jump to the next one. It says a source of pride. Those, yeah. those two sort of capture it for a lot of people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, I have, it's really just about keeping a connection with family. I find Canada doesn't really have a whole lot of heritage. So being able to say my dad immigrated from Ireland gives us something to identify with. We plan on moving back one day because everyone loves the Irish. That reminds me, I ran into somebody, I was coming back from Dublin a few years ago and I, I was talking to a gentleman behind me and he had a, he was, I guess he had just been in a rugby tournament. Anyway, we started talking, I said, that I'm from Canada and uh, we got into discussion. He said, well, <clears throat> he says, you know, Ireland has, we have uh, uh, too much history and not enough geography and you have too much geography and not enough history. <laughs> 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 I don't remember that one. <laughs> I've never heard, never heard it put that way, but it's a valid point, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty good, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. My Irish heritage is at the heart of who I am. I inherited an embarrassment of riches, knowledge, courage, strength from my Irish people who gave me the map, who showed me how to get from point A to point B with my freedom intact and how to laugh about all the rest of it. <laughs> I like that one. It's the work ethic know. and the sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Another one here. I, I am so removed from it. Family came during great hunger, but I see the heritage of storytelling, singing, clever wordsmithing, a love for sport, the arts and history. All of these things were passed down to me. I'm pretty grateful. I was born into Irish ancestry. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's, that's the nub of it. I think for a lot of yeah. uh, people of Irish descent in Canada, it's like the, the previous one, you know, if you haven't been to Ireland, You've got this sense of pride that comes through your family and the music and the culture um, without being, you know, sort of having touched it and felt it. Yeah. Uh, but it, but it's deeply important to you. And that's it. I think it's the Irish heritage allows you so, so many ways to participate. You know, you don't have to plow through all the history books. You can learn some Irish songs or yeah. you can play an Irish sport or you can go to an Irish music session. You know, there's just all these different kind of ways and you can, choose what you like to to, to do you know um, yeah. and that quote kind of captures that yeah does it ever um i have one here i took a two-week vacation in ireland and tracked down 17 ancestors graves oh. sat and stared at the farmhouse outside manor hamilton beautiful country dripping in history rich in culture and music means the world to know where roots are yeah, that's, you know, that that type of uh, journey. I remember the first time I went to Ireland, and I told you the story, I found mm. the church where my great, great, great grandparents were married. And it, it's a very powerful moment when you sort of, you know, you identify with your roots, you find the place where part of it started or part yeah. of the journey, you know, took, yeah. an important part of the journey took place. So I, I can relate to that one. Hmm. Yeah, like you and, and so many others, they often find that when they go back to Ireland or they go to Ireland for the first time, they, they have a feeling I've, I've come home. You yeah. know? 
Well, Irish, the greatest Irish export of all, in my opinion, is culture. And mm. it's done in so many times that people don't even realize it. It's part of their lives and they don't realize it. Exactly. That's why this discussion is so important. Yeah. All right. So the next, on that note, <clears throat> the next one, I just found out through DNA results that I have Irish roots. I can celebrate all the awesome Irish traditions and holidays with pride. I love it. Yeah, and don't forget, if even if you don't have Irish roots, we love having people as part of our affinity diaspora too. You know, so right. you don't have to be Irish to be to to be Irish and involved. Uh, well, I've got one here: an inheritance of passion for life, live hard, work hard, laugh hard, combined with a strong Christian value system. Again, that's bang bang on. Yeah, but yeah, that's a sampling of some of the responses, which captures quite quite a lot of the uh, the reasons for Irish pride in, in heritage and why it's such a living thing. Yeah, very much. I mean, it's, and, and, you know, we're, it's March, it's March the 3rd. Um, and, uh, you know, this month, as we progress towards the 17th, that, that sense of uh, Irish pride just grows. And as you said, even those who don't have Irish blood flowing through their veins, they, they, uh, they're still proud of the connection. And want yeah. to celebrate all things Irish. Yeah, and one of one of our uh, one of the comments there said it's a it's a it's a kind of a moment now, and I think that's right. This is a coming out moment because uh, the reason why the story of the Irish in Canada is kind of buried is that they they had to adjust to a society that was you know British Anglophone Protestant loyal to the crown. So in a right. way, um, the story was kept quiet, and now is a kind of a moment of pride and 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 coming out and saying you know. This is the story. This is a, this is an amazing story, um, uh, over over three hundred years long. Yeah, and it's and if you look at the story from the fifty Irish lives, the the stories from the different generations, there's the similarities are there, and it's this it's this evolution, but there's a consistency throughout it about you know Irish pride, Irish heritage, and Irish values that have transcended all of the problems that they encountered. Mm. And ended up, you know, becoming a big part of our culture. And if you look at our politics, uh, our business traditions, um, our geography, you can see, you see it everywhere. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, it, no matter which generation is coming in, there all there's always this connection with Ireland, or there's reach back. So you have these colonial administrators, and one of their passions is like import. And this is in the eighteen in in the in the the seventeen hundreds importing irish racing horses you know right uh, or or bringing in bringing musicians from ireland or whatever there's always this kind of search for the the continued connection and then passing on that irish connection from one generation to the next yeah and it's and as you've said many times it's, if you're <clears throat> because of the size of our country this the traditions that exist in one part of the country are different from others but they've they've continued you know they've yeah. they've been passed along and now this this exercise that we're going through now is bringing this all together, yeah, and showing that uh, uh, notwithstanding all of the local differences and uh, nuances, uh, it all comes back to the same the same sense of pride and history. Yeah, exactly. One of the things we've lined up here as well, James, of course, is um, reflections on some of the contributors to this process about what it means for them to be Irish. So we'll we'll have a listen to some of those. Yeah. So now we're going to hear from Professor Emeritus Elizabeth Smythe about what her heritage means to her, but also she's written a profile of Mother Teresa Deese, who was a foundational figure in uh, Canadian education. She came from Ireland um, and many of her family actually were uh, in different places around the empire. So uh, Mother Teresa Deese represents um she's kind of symbolic of the connections that the irish preserved no matter where they were in the empire um the strength of her irish identity and the contribution that she made as a woman leader uh in her community i'm elizabeth smythe i'm a professor emeritus uh, at the university of toronto my irish heritage is the lens through which i remember most of my youth like my two subjects for 50 Irish Lives, I am Irish born and journeyed to Canada, but on a Cunard ship, the Sylvania, with my mother and my sister to join my father who had traveled before us. As a seven-year-old, I took my first trip on a plane to celebrate my Irish heritage and visit other members of the Irish diaspora, 
the occasion being the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City. I vividly remember the wind tunnel effect that I felt sitting on the viewing stands outside of St. Patrick's Cathedral. My memories of St. Patrick's Day always evoke winter weather, bad, cold winter weather, marching and dancing in the St. Patrick's Day parades, first with the Gagan School of Dancing and later with the Butler School of Dancing, and being driven through blizzards on icy roads to perform at nursing homes and dinner dances. Summers were fish season, practicing and traveling around Southern Ontario, Michigan, and New York State. And all the practices that my father drove me and my sisters to, we would be learning in the car traditional Irish songs as we drove the roads. The Rose of Tralee, the Mountains of Morn, Danny Boy, the Bolfinian Men. My father always reminded us of the mass graves of Irish immigrants under the high level bridge as we drove between Hamilton and Toronto. And one more memory. When the butlers changed their Irish dancing costumes, I learned to embroider, to stitch the yards and yards of Celtic swirls on the skirts and the bodices that, of the costumes that my mother had made. Some souvenirs of my youth I retain still, the first medal I ever won for an Irish dance you know, for a reel. As a historian, my own ethnocultural experience informs my understanding of Canada as a land of immigrants and how the marginalized and the refugees experience Canadian society, both its challenges and its benefits. So why did I choose the two women I did? So I'm a historian of education and a professor at the University of Toronto. As an undergraduate and graduate student, I was interested in learning more about gender, religion, and education, especially higher education. For women, this intersectionality took me down many paths, and uh, including to the study of the origin of the two Catholic women's colleges at the University of Toronto and the religious orders that founded them. My subjects for 50 Irish Lives are two women religious. Women religious is a scholarly term for nuns and sisters. Mother Teresa Dees, who was born in Kildare in 1822, she was a member of the Dublin-based Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Loretto Sisters. Mother Bernard Dynan, born in 1829 in McCroom County, Cork, she was a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph, a French order founded in the 17th century in Le Puy, France. With the entry of women like Mother Dynan, the, the order became predominantly Irish. Both of these women had a great influence on the history of education in Ontario. Mother Dees, the Loretto sister, was an educational innovator. She encouraged the credentialing of her sisters by the state. She supported the aligning of the Loretto curriculum with a provincial one, thus enabling its graduates to qualify as teachers and for admission to tertiary education. This had a huge impact on the rest of the orders, all of which relied their academy curriculum with the state curriculum. Mother Dees laid the foundations for Loretto College at the University of Toronto. In governance, she oversaw the establishment of Loretto in North America as independent of the, the mother house in Rath Farnham. She represents much more than this. She embodies a largely understudied part of multiple networks of Irish women who were uh, part of biological families, ecclesiastical families, ethnocultural families. Although Mother Dees was an Anglo-Irish, she was firmly rooted in her Irish identity. Mother Dynan, the member of the Sisters of St. Joseph, is representative of a segment of female Irish immigrants. It was her chosen path as a vowed religious that launched her on the immigrant path. Like many of uh, the other Irish women who joined the community of the Sisters of St. Joseph, she illustrates how immigrant women were able to take advantage of emerging opportunities and rise to positions of leadership. In her case, Mother Dinan oversaw the further expansion of the purpose-built motherhouse complex in Toronto, and she also broadened the, the work of the community to include 
ministering to female inmates in jails and psychiatric facilities, establishing boarding homes for working women, and extending the community's work in education to include night schools. This June, when I visited Loretto Dalkey and walked along the seafront, I wondered what the founders would think of what the, these women did. Mother Teresa Ball, the Loretto uh, superior who sent the Irish uh, women here to Toronto, she would have watched them sail. And I wonder if she could have imagined the impact that these women had. My two subjects who sailed like many of those women did represent one sector of Irish immigrant women, single women who traveled as part of a religious community. In the cases of Mother Deese and Mother Dinan, they represent Irish women who have gone on to do much to promote education, social service, and health care. Now we're going to hear from Professor Michelle Holmgren from Mount Royal University. Uh, she's just published a book called Canada to Ireland, which recounts the early influence of um, Irish figures in Canada, uh, people like which, which are a bit surprising, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, for example, the famous Irish patriot, uh, who spent some time in Canada, and whose letters were quite formative in recording his impressions of Canada, and of its freedom, and, and indeed of its nature. Um, it's a terrific book, I'd highly recommend it. Um, but Michelle has written a profile of a fascinating Irish woman, uh, who became a writer, um, and who gave insights into what it was like to be um, uh, living on, on the prairies of the newly colonized Northwest. Hi, I'm Michelle Holmgren. I teach at Mount Royal University in Calgary. Uh, my Irish heritage is complex. My mother's from Australia and her Irish ancestors uh, went to the gold fields of Ballarat and married and raised families there starting in the 1850s. And my mother came to Canada for a visit and is still here. I sort of completed the circle when I lived in Ireland for three and a half years and studied Irish literature at Queen's University in Belfast. So our family's experience of who we are is shaped by many migrations. I'm always fascinated by family stories. The novelist Peter Behrens talked about how people today are one hand clasp away from significant events such as the Irish famine. My grandfather knew his grandfather, and so I knew a man who knew an eyewitness to the famine. My grandparents and mother told me family stories and recited the poetry of Henry Lawson and Banjo Patterson, famous Australian balladeers who drew from the same literary traditions employed by Irish nationalists, who believed that ballads could ensure the oral transmission of histories and legends and also convey something about the essential spirit of a place. My grandfather loved Robert Service as well, a Canadian poet in that narrative ballad tradition. Diasporic writers uh, bring fresh eyes and so they can be very good at capturing the spirit of a place they visit. This all leads to why I've decided to profile Agnes Shakespeare Higginson's screen, besides the fact that it's fun to say her name. Uh, she was born in Mauritius, but raised in County Antrim, which she loved. Using the pen name Myra O'Neill, she became a popular poet who apparently outsold William Butler Yeats in the early 20th century with her songs from the glens of Antrim. Because she mostly wrote dialect poems, she's gone out of fashion, but she's an interesting diasporic poet. One of the reasons that she had the time to write is that in the 1890s, she moved with her husband to a ranch just down the road from Calgary. She was quite happy to trade all the social niceties of the Anglo-Irish gentry for a freer life on a prairie ranch, where she had the leisure to write extensively about her Irish home, as well as the prairies. Poets and newcomers alike have the ability to move beyond habitual ways of seeing things and to take a second look at something we might take for granted, like the wide prairie skies, for instance. To her, the particular light of a prairie winter was a new wonder that she shared with her Irish readers. And here's an excerpt. Then when the time of winter sunset comes, there is a half hour of strange, delicate brilliancy, a blush of color across the snow, a dazzling whiteness along the ridges that catch the level rays of light, deepening into a hundred tones of blue and violet between dark stretches of the leafless willow and cottonwood trees, with here and there a gleam like the green light of an opal. Her two books of poetry consisted of poems about her childhood home, often recollected and written while in Canada, 
as well as poems about her new home in the Northwest. The diasporic perspective she brought to her writing helped her capture what was most memorable and characteristic in both countries. Professor Mark McGowan has been uh, a great uh, supporter of the 50 Irish Lives Project. Uh, he's a fantastic historian of the Irish in Canada, going back many, many years. Um, he's published extensively, including on the famine, and he's been leading a project um, of exploring the archives of Strokestown House and the forced relocation of 1,400 tenants from the estate to Canada uh, in 1847. It's, it's an amazing and moving stuff. He draws from his, his life as an historian and from his researchers in presenting a, a number of profiles for 50 Irish lives in Canada and talks about what his own heritage means to him. Uh, my name is Mark McGowan. I'm a professor of history and Celtic studies at St. Michael's College in the University of Toronto, but speaking to you today from Whitby, which is about 50 kilometers outside of Toronto. Um, I'm actually six generations Irish Canadian on my mother's side. Her family came uh, in the 1820s, well before the famine, and settled in farmsteads uh, near Lake Huron. Um, my father's family, I'm, I'm three generations Irish and Scottish Canadian. They were Glaswegian Irish who came uh, after the First World War, and so my Irish heritage is 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 very much uh, rooted uh, in the immigrant experience and also uh, in uh, in in being here uh, uh, as a as an Irish Canadian family for a long time. But through that heritage, I've learned uh, um, the values of, of the faith that they transmitted with them, um, the music, um, the poetry, the culture. Um, and in some ways, it stimulated my own interests in being uh, a historian and a storyteller uh, and uh, quite by accident, uh, eventually telling the stories uh, that were uh, germane to my own background, and that is the history of Ireland, the history of migration, uh, and in particular, um, the history of the famine, where some of the family members uh, did emerge and intermarried with pre-famine uh, Irish Canadians. Uh, and in a sense, uh, it's in doing the fieldwork in Ireland that rekindled uh, much of my appreciation for that heritage, especially uh, in uh, West Kerry, where my mother's family had originally uh, emigrated from. And so um, these are, are things that I treasure both personally and professionally. And it was one of the reasons why I wanted to engage uh, in the 50 Irish Lives Project. Um, and curiously enough, I've, I've contributed uh, at least six biographies uh, to the project and at least one shared biography with, uh, with the ambassador himself. Um, Two of the people that I chose, uh, uh, John Joseph Lynch and Thomas Lewis Connolly, were both uh, Roman Catholic bishops, Irish born, but had uh, foundational roles in setting up the infrastructure. Lynch for the church in Ontario. He was Archbishop of Toronto in the mid 19th century. And Connolly, uh, both as Bishop of St. John, New Brunswick, and as Archbishop of Halifax in about the same time period as Lynch. And so they're contemporaries, and they're both builders, uh, and they create a very important uh, set of structures within their diocese for, for Irish Catholics in, in both regions. I also chose Richard Uniac, who because I thought that Protestants might be underrepresented in 50 Irish lives. And he was an Irish Protestant who was who was instrumental uh, both as a legislat uh, legislator in early 19th century Halifax, uh, but also in uh, in gathering together the statutes and laws of Nova Scotia to make them usable and to build uh, a legal and political framework um, for the province. I chose Frank Smith. Uh, who was also Irish born uh, because he was one of the most noted Irish Catholic entrepreneurs in 19th century Canada. And in fact, he he was offered the prime ministership of Canada uh, at one point, but refused it because of age and ill health uh, close to the end of the 19th century. But he was a politician, the original owner of what is now the Toronto Transit Commission and one of Canada's most noted wholesalers and retailers in the country and held a Senate seat for several decades. Uh, I also chose um, 
uh, Patrick Reed, William Patrick Reed, uh, a more contemporary figure, uh, uh, born in Northern Ireland, came to Canada after a very uh, distinguished military career, uh, and uh, in the 1960s became instrumental in giving us our own distinctive flag because he worked for part of the civil service that was uh, um, Im important for marketing Canada, and it, it fell upon him <clears throat> uh, to uh, really uh, bring designers in and approve the maple leaf flag that we have today. And I thought he was a really important kind of figure uh, nationally in Canada and one who was uh, 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 unknown. Uh, interestingly enough, um, as a social historian, um, I also wanted to tell the story of those who normally are forgotten in history. And so I wrote biographies of Catherine and Daniel Ty. They were two orphan children who uh, arrive in Canada with their family decimated during the Great Irish Famine uh, in 1847 and are taken in by a French Canadian family, uh, the Coulombs in Lobinier uh, in Quebec. And their story is quite distinctive as other orphans, for example, were used as indentured labor and domestic servants uh, in many of the homes in which they were taken. Uh, the, the, the Thai children, at least Daniel Thai, actually inherits the farm from the childless couple. And that farm today is in the hands of the fourth generation, his great grandson, Richard. Um, Catherine worked for the local parishes in Lobinier, but it's a really interesting story, both of the famine from a very different uh, from from below angle, but also one that that shows uh, the the persistence of uh, uh, of Irishness even in Quebec. Uh, uh, the Thai family uh, actually uh, revisited. Um, the estate in Roscommon at Strokestown, where uh, the original ties had come from. So famine story through the ties uh, uh, comes uh, full circle. Finally, I collaborated on a piece uh, on Tag O'Brennan, who was really the first recorded Irish person in Canadian history uh, in 17th century New France, but it was an essay that expands upon the French uh, and the welcome that Irish uh, refugees from the New England colonies, uh, uh, those who were in the French military, uh, receive and have an Irish presence in Quebec. Close to 100 families in 1700 uh, had uh, an Irish born or an Irish descendant uh, as head of those families. And so another important tale that most Canadians would not be aware of, and that is um, the Irish presence uh, in New France. So uh, all told, um, these biographies uh, give quite a, a kaleidoscope of, uh, of experiences of Irish born people who come to Canada uh, and make uh, a difference. Uh, David Wilson is Professor of Celtic Studies and History at the University of Toronto. Uh, David is also one of our contributors, and uh, he's just published this book, uh, Canadian Spy Story. Um, reads like an espionage novel, but it's a brilliant history of a, a very strange and complicated chapter in the Irish story in Canada uh, about the Fenians, and that's his focus in 50 Irish Lives. Hello, my name is David Wilson. I'm a professor in the Celtic Studies program at the University of Toronto, and I'm general editor of the Dictionary of Canadian Biography. I've been working in the field of Irish Canadian studies uh, for the best part of two decades, and I'm uh, very happy to be participating in the Irish Lives project. The person I've chosen to focus on uh, is perhaps an unusual choice. Um, his name is Michael Murphy, and uh, he's not very well known um, outside a uh, certain section of Irish Canadian studies, but I've chosen him because he is part of an aspect of Irish Canadian life uh, that is generally overlooked, but which nonetheless was very significant uh, during the mid 19th century. And that is the existence of a Fenian or Irish revolutionary underground within Canada uh, at that time, particularly during the 1860s. And it may well be that as many as a quarter to a third of Irish Catholic immigrants to Canada uh, in the mid 19th century uh, were supporters, sympathizers, or members of the Fenian Brotherhood. 
Michael Murphy was the founder of the uh, Fenian movement within Canada. He's a Cork man. He was born in 1826. Uh, he worked uh, as a cooper in Toronto uh, and eventually opened up his own tavern. And in 1858, after a, a St. Patrick's Day riot in Toronto, in which a young Catholic was killed, Michael Murphy forms uh, the Hibernian Benevolent Society, not to be confused with the ancient order of Hibernians, completely different organization. And the Hibernian Benevolent Society was designed to protect Irish Catholics from orange aggression in the city. And it became the vehicle through which the Fenian Brotherhood entered Canada. Uh, not all Hibernian Benevolent Society members were Fenians, but uh, the organization served as a front organization for the Fenian Brotherhood. And Michael Murphy was a charismatic figure. He was described as a, a small man of slight build, sharp features um, and dark beard. Uh, one of his enemies said that he had much mother wit and great sturdiness of character. He was clearly a very important figure within Toronto. And, and then uh, the Hibernian Benevolent Society spreads outwards. A new society, sister societies are formed uh, throughout Canada. And Michael Murphy goes on mission uh, to uh, basically uh, proselytize the cause of Irish revolutionary nationalism. We also find him at a uh, Fenian convention in Philadelphia as a Canadian delegate. Uh, where he says that 100,000, this is 1865, he makes a claim that 100,000 Irish Canadians were prepared to support a Fenian-led invasion of Canada, uh, and that they were eagerly anticipating striking a blow before Christmas. This was a, a vast exaggeration, and I don't know that the, dele the other delegates necessarily took him seriously, uh, he was very good at exaggerating uh, and making extravagant statements. At St. Patrick's Day celebrations in Toronto, uh, he made the equally extravagant claims that 200 or sorry, 20,000 Irish Canadians would gladly shed their blood uh, for Irish freedom. And he doubled the number the following year. 40,000 Irish Canadians would shed their blood for Irish freedom. Uh, and then went on to say that uh, a million Irish lives lost in the cause of Irish freedom would not be lost in vain. I mean, these are just sort of staggering remarks that he made. But he was very popular within Fenian circles in the country. He was described as the grand old patriot uh, and clearly inspired many others. Um, and we find him actually putting his, uh, his money where his mouth was, so to speak, uh, in 1866, when uh, he answers the call to support a Fenian-led invasion, planned Fenian-led invasion of New Brunswick in April of 1866. But the authorities got wind of it, and he and his fellow Fenians uh, were stopped en route to New Brunswick at Cornwall and uh, put in Cornwall jail, uh, arrested. Um, and uh, actually, the authorities had, had nothing really to get them on, except that they were heading for New Brunswick. They were carrying revolvers, which wasn't illegal. They were carrying daggers, which wasn't illegal. They had a thousand dollars with them, which, of course, wasn't illegal. They had a cipher with them. That was not illegal either. They hadn't actually done anything illegal. So there they were in Cornwall jail as the government is desperately trying to round up information uh, to nail them. And uh, they're quite confident that they will get off. But the longer they stay in Cornwall jail, the more they decide they need to break out. And they do that. They tunnel uh, out of the jail and they make their way across Lake Ontario uh, to the United States, where they are fated by Irish Americans as, uh, as martyrs and heroes. And Michael Murphy winds up uh, moving to Buffalo, uh, where he starts up uh, his another tavern, which is called the Irish Arms has a nice double meaning to it, I think, uh, and uh, spends his time uh, meeting uh, other Fenians and particularly uh, having reunions with uh, his Fenian comrades from Canada. But he takes ill and uh, he gets tuberculosis 
And in 1868, April of 1868, uh, four days after the assassination of Thomas Darcy McGee, uh, the great enemy of Fenianism in Canada, uh, Michael Murphy uh, dies of tuberculosis. Um, unlike Darcy McGee, he does not have a massive funeral with tens of thousands in attendance, but he's not forgotten either. His body is, is brought back to Toronto. A large crowd meets the train that carries his remains, and the streets were lined with Irish-Canadian admirers as his coffin was carried to St. Michael's Cathedral. And for um, for Fenians from the United States who would come from time to time to speak in Toronto and keep the cause alive, uh, he was no, excuse me, he was often mentioned in glowing terms uh, as a source of inspiration. Uh, so there you are. This is an outline of the of the life and times of uh, Michael Murphy, uh, someone who came close to being lost from historical consciousness, uh, but whose career. Uh, opens up a window into a whole other side of Irish Canadian history, the revolutionary countercurrent against the dominant strain uh, of uh, Irish Canadian loyalism. Most Irish Canadians remained loyal to Canada, but a significant minority did not. And Michael Murphy was at the heart of that minority. Michael Murphy, 1826 to 1868. Thank you. So, James, I think we're really blessed to have uh, academics of such uh, standing and expertise contributing to this project, but also, um, you know, carrying the torch uh, for the story of the Irish throughout their whole careers, you know, because in some ways it's a, it's a minority preoccupation in Canada. So we're really, really lucky to have them on board. I couldn't agree more. And, it's, it, it, you know, they've they've really filled in the story. Um, you know, if you think about just some of the some of the contributions here, you it goes from sports to uh, religion. It goes to the school system in the province of Ontario. It goes to you know the separate school system in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, our governors general, um, politics, culture, you you name it. Our flag. I mean, all of these stories are just tremendous parts of our history. And, and as you said, we're incredibly lucky to have such. Uh, significant people who are dedicated to telling these stories and the people who read them are going to have, I'm confident they're going to have the same reaction I did. It's just, it's remarkable. All these things that mm -hmm. you're aware of, you just didn't know how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd encourage people actually as well, because David uh, Wilton is also the editor of the uh, dictionary of Canadian biography. And, and sometimes it's an interesting game to play. You just, it's online, it's free online, bang in an Irish surname. It's quite amazing. You just you'll you'll find out sort of more 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 stories as well. Um, the next phase of this, of course, is we're asking for public submissions. So it's pretty easy if you can reduce your favorite uh, person to a one thousand word uh, profile. Um, we'll 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 have a look at it, and uh, it'll be certainly on our online bank of of profiles, which will grow, I think, well beyond the fifty. Um, but you never know, it may actually make the final cut for, for, for the production. So we post details of how you can submit um, submit a person to the 50 Irish Lives project. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think it's going to grow well beyond 50. There's, there's lots of stories like these that need to be told and will be told over, over time. Yeah. And, and that's, well, you know, once we get into first and second generation, you know, there are, it, 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 there's an infinite number of stories to be told, but it'd be great to have them online. Well, if you, if you do that, you're going to have to change 50 to 500 <laughs> think, or, or maybe more. Add a few zeros. That's yeah. right. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a tremendous, it's a tremendous initiative. And again, thank you for doing this and leading this. And thank you to all the contributors and the writers who have put this thing together. It's, uh, it's yeah. the beginning of uh, telling a story that needs to be told and reminding people the importance of our history here in Canada and uh, just reminding us how much we should appreciate our our history and our culture. That's right. And I think we should also say that there are uh, Irish study programs at a number of uh, Canadian universities. Uh, some of them are full time, whole degree courses, other are elective courses. So I think one of our hopes, James, is that this book will encourage um, undergraduate students and graduate students to consider Irish studies and the story of the Irish in, in Canada. 
as an area worth uh, worth examining. I I think it it has to because as I said my own reaction. I'm learning all of these things I wasn't aware of. Uh, if I knew I had an opportunity to make this part of my curriculum when I was going to university, you know, you know, in the category, if I'd known then what I know now, mm -hmm. uh, I would have done it. And I yeah. think I think it's going to have that effect absolutely. And there's going to be a lot of young people who are going to look at this as an opportunity to pursue a, uh, an aspect of their education they weren't even you know fully aware of. I think that's right. It's also, I sometimes think that when people see Celtic studies, they think about harps and mythology and literature and, and it's kind of quaint and old. Um, whereas in fact, I think what, what we've discovered in 50 Irish Lives is that the story of the Irish in Canada is not an immigration story. It's fundamentally a story about colonialism. You cannot explain the varieties of Irishness uh, over 300 years that turn up in Canada without that colonial framing narrative you know so if you have the anglo-irish guys who are coming in as colonial administrators in the 18th century the the anglo-irish who were governor generals the forced relocation of tenants from the colonial state in wicklow for example in the 1847 to the 1850s um the guys who enter and came into the lumber industry you know yeah. as, as, as business people and so on you know immigration is just a subset of this and so if you're going to do Irish studies, you are doing colonial studies. If you're doing colonial studies, you are beginning to understand the world um, in which you live. And I think it also helps to, ex to explain and put in context um, the respective colonial experiences of the indigenous and the Irish. So it really is a portal into, you know, the, 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 the history of our civilization and, and how Canada and the United States were established as you know, outcomes of a colonializing process. I think you're right. I mean, if <clears throat> you know, when I was younger, I think back, and I think young people have you, you hear Celtic studies, you're not thinking about the things we're talking about because, mm. as we've said before, you know, Canadian history is really Irish Canadian history in many respects. Mm -hmm. And as you said earlier, this this makes it real because you're talking about uh, things that we're seeing and living uh, and touching today. And, you know, so the, the study is not only just Canadian history, but it's understanding the things that you're you know, dealing with day to day, our institutions, our parliamentary institutions, yeah. our, our physical in infrastructure, our education system, uh, our, our religious environment, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of these things um, are part of this, you know, program that you're talking about. So maybe maybe what we do is we change the name of the program to entice more people to do it. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here. Maybe that's part, yeah, of, yeah. part yeah. of the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you if you study um, Canadian history, really what you're talking about, and it's back to my comment earlier about, you know, lots of geography, not enough history. Mm. Um, you know, Canadian history goes back a few hundred years, but it's a story of politics and all of these things coming together. And the Irish... The Irish uh, immigration over the generations played such a significant role, and as all of these stories tell us. So, mm. uh, I'm sure this is going to be the impetus for something much larger, and you're going to see Celtic studies programs at uh, more than just the few universities in Canada that have them now. It's going to be uh, a bigger part of the curriculum across the country, is my my expectation or right. prediction. Yeah, right. The Canada Ireland Foundation is a really important asset. Um, based, James, in your own neighbourhood of Toronto, but has been en engaged in this tremendous development of building an actual centre down by the waterfront and enhancing, you know, Toronto itself. But the Canada Ireland Foundation and Robert Kearns um, have been uh, really uh, leading the way in terms of uh, profiling and promoting the story of the Irish in Canada. They have indeed. I mean, the... Uh, the evolution of what uh, Robert and uh, his supporters have done over the last 10 years or so is remarkable. And you're going to see the this all culminate with the, the opening of the building, hopefully in the not too distant future down on the waterfront, right beside Ireland, Ireland Park, which is another way that the stories we're talking about are going to be told. It's a, it's a place where people can go to learn about these stories and learn so much more about our heritage. And uh, Robert uh, has been a uh, groundbreaker and a real motivating force in making all this happen. So we're all very grateful to him and his team for, for bringing this together and bringing it to where it is now.
Yeah, absolutely. I often say if if there was an Oscar for heritage, certainly Robert would be would be a winner, you know. But uh, let's hear from Robert himself. We're joined now by Robert Kearns, who's chair and founder of the Canada Ireland Foundation, um, doing tremendous work uh, preserving and promoting the heritage um, of the Irish in Canada. Uh, Robert, just wanted to, to, to discuss your first kind of engagement with Irish issues in Canada, which started with the Ireland Funds uh, promoting reconciliation in Northern Ireland. I mean, that, that was when, in the 1980s? Yeah, that was May 1980. And um, yeah, I hardly had my hat and coat off. And uh, I came in November 79. And, uh, you know, I had a very happy childhood in Ireland. I was very proud of my Irish heritage. And uh, I thought this was a great idea to create an awareness in Canada of some of the issues and challenges on the island of Ireland. And mm -hmm. the early 80s were very tough times. Mm -hmm. So engaging Irish Canadians uh, and uh, people of Irish heritage in Canada with the issues in in but all of Ireland, but also in Northern Ireland, I thought was really important. And it was a way to give back and stay in touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sometimes forgotten that Canada made a huge contribution, not only private efforts like your own and philanthropic efforts, but also the Canadian government of the peace process. But then uh, you, you move uh, into into um, the more the heritage end and the kind of the connection with Ireland at a more academic level. Um, and that started <clears throat> you on a road towards what you've been doing on the Canada Ireland Foundation. So what were the first steps uh, that you yeah, well, took? You know, it's like the, these things are always in evolution. And mm. so from, I suppose, from uh, May 1980 through until I would say, you know, I stepped back from the Ireland Fund for a sabbatical in 1994. And then I rejoined it uh, to support my friend Bill Neal when he became chairman. Right. And uh, that would, would have been in 1996. Right. But along the way, uh, I really was very drawn to academia, and that was uh, being promoted at uh, St. Michael's College in the University of Toronto. And so I was very keen to become involved in that because my studies in Ireland at UCD were archaeology, Greek and Roman civilization, ah, and history. Yeah. So getting back and connecting to academia yeah. made a great deal of sense for me. And I thought this would also be a great way of creating awareness in Canada of the contribution that people had made to Canada. But also, let's not forget, this is a it's a two-way story, and it's really mm -hmm. important to be aware and to help people in Ireland understand the long, long-standing, warm friendship that Canada's had for Ireland and yeah. has championed Irish causes all along the way. So I thought academia was a great way to do that. And then in 1997, it was the 150th anniversary year of the Great Famine. And well, Rowan particularly Gillespie, of the particularly of the arrival of the Irish yeah, famine yeah. in Canada in in eighteen forty seven. So obviously this yeah. this is kind of arrives on your on your radar then in nineteen ninety seven. Yeah. yeah, well, I'd actually you know as I was winding down my involvement with the Ireland funds as mm. chair, uh, I was uh, visiting Ireland and connected with Norma Smurfett, whom I I'd met in nineteen eighty seven. And what an inspiring lady she was then and is now. Mm. And so a great patron of the arts. And uh, she introduced me to Suzanne McDougall of the Solomon Gallery. And together they introduced me to Rowan Gillespie. And oh, Rowan right. had already started to create two or three bronze sculptures of famine migrants. And then Norma invited him to expand that into a larger group and then purchased them from him and donated them to the city of Dublin people of Ireland. Right. So I asked Rowan, I said, if I could get a waterfront location in Toronto, uh, would he sculpt a new group? And he very generously said he would. Now, before we we uh, to look at your ambition, just grabbing a piece of waterfront real estate in Toronto, yeah. I, I'm curious as to, you know, because you're Irish, you might be aware of the famine and so on. But what kind of awareness was there in, in Toronto or Canada at the time of 1847 and uh, you know in in the in the kind of the canadian public imagination i wouldn't have imagined it was it was that high or, or prominent it was not to the extent it is now right um bob o'driscoll uh, with the support of uh, catherine graham and uh, uh father jackman had published uh the irish in canada the, the two-volume book uh, through celtic studies Mm. And then there was uh, Action Grosil, 
uh, were very successful in creating awareness and lobbying uh, for the protection of Goro Seal uh, from becoming a holiday destination and holiday homes, which is a horrific thought to think of today. Yeah. So, um, you know, I met John Masterson through that because at the time uh, I was trying to get permission to install sculptures uh, on the waterfront in Toronto because that would link the waterfront of Dublin with the waterfront of Toronto. Yeah. And I kept bumping into the public art committee and the public art committee said, you have to have a competition before you can put up sculpture. Mercifully, I was good friends with uh, Terry Smith, who was deputy minister of culture at the time. And she said, well, you know, the way to deal with that is an Irish solution to an Irish problem. Ask them for a handkerchief of land to form a park, and then you can put your own sculpture in the park. So the, the search for a waterfront location became a search for a small handkerchief of land into which we could put the sculptures in a designed environment that my brother Jonathan created for Ireland Park. So that was really the journey. And uh, mm. so many, many people along the way uh, contributed to it. And, the, you know, the early money, the very first significant check we got was from Oliver Murray. And uh, the second significant checks we got, uh, you know, were from uh, the Ireland funds. And they gave us the first gift that gave us the momentum and gave us the credibility to uh, uh, to do the work we set out to do. And it was a, yeah. it was a lot of work and a long journey. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, they're, the, the statues themselves are incredibly evocative because uh, we often don't visualize what the famine was like and the impact on people and i think the connection with dublin is is a fantastic one because not many people in ireland know about how dramatic the movement of 106,000 famine refugees basically all going to canada you know it's yeah. not, not all that clear so you took your your small chunk of of waterfront real estate and um you've expanded its ambitions now uh with the building of of a center do you want to to describe what your what your vision for that is yeah well creating ireland park was the so the progression was from raising money to support mm -hmm. projects in ireland to raising money to support uh, education and academia in canada about the irish in canada so i asked mark mcgowan to conduct research into the story of what happened in this city and to do so from all the original sources, because if we if we were to be connected to the to the media and to the press at the time, we had to be making comments that were based on truthful accounts of what took right. place. So Mark was the ideal person to do that, and there was very very little published at the time in 1997, 98. Uh, it took four years to get the site for the park from lobbying and starting in 1996 and 1997 with the Economic Planning and Development Committee, yeah. and around at that time called John McIntyre. And then gradually, uh, with the help of uh, Councillor Olivia Chow, a motion was passed in council at July, August of 2000 to actually get the site for the, for the park. But at that time, there was a, some issues around Canada's metronome, which occupied the building and all of that land, they were in a 99 year lease. So uh, we allowed, I allowed the situation to lie dormant for a couple of years because I didn't want us to be perceived to be the downfall of Canada's metronome. So there was a postponement between July, August, uh, when we got the land and the, initi the initiation of the fundraising, which was on the 21st of June, 2000 and, uh, 2004. Right. So, uh, you know, I think I'm very glad in retrospect that we did that. And then, of mm. course, it was a further seven years before we actually opened the park with uh, with Mary McAleese. So, um, you know, sometimes these things have circuitous journeys. Yeah. Um, the fact that one of our great champions in the city was Councillor Olivia Chow, uh, an immigrant from Hong Kong, right. uh, is fantastic. And, uh, you know, I treasure the relationship with all of our former councillors who've been great supporters and uh you know it's that's what makes the journey all the more enjoyable yeah i certainly recommend uh everybody to, everybody to go on the canada ireland uh, foundation website see the corlick building um and uh it's currently under construction at the moment but it's going to be i think a, a, an asset and an amazing jewel for not just the heritage, but the, the kind of vibrant relationship between Ireland and Canada and what we can do to develop it and, and, and nurture it. But, I, but in looking back and, and, you know, it's Irish Heritage Month, how do you kind of sum up the Irish in Canada and your, your feelings about that heritage? Well, um, before I answer that in full, I want to just mm. complete the 
previous question about yeah. you know expanding to the Corlick. And again, I've got to thank Mark McGowan because he called me one day and he says, you're not going to believe this, Robert, but uh, the doctor who looked after the migrants at uh, King and John Street was Dr. George Robert Crisset, who was a, of Anglo-Irish background and an Anglican. So right. it's a great story for Toronto that the doctors, uh, Dr. Hamilton and uh, uh Dr. Grissett, the nurses and the hospital orderlies all came from both British and Irish backgrounds. And so in that process, then I thought, well, look, it's it would not be correct to create a memorial of the arrival of the Irish in this city during the famine. Of course, Irish people had been here before then. But I thought it was really important that we acknowledge that they were taken in and received by Canadians living in this city of 20,000 at the time when 38,000 arrived, because then we'd be the only city in the diaspora that had a park to commemorate their arrival, but also want to acknowledge those who volunteered and lost their mm -hmm. lives helping them. So that then led on to the building because I'd always made it clear to all the councillors along the way, I want that building because it's the logical uh, visitor centre for the park. And it was then vacant and it was a heritage building on the waterfront beside Arlen Park and right beside uh, the uh, what then became the uh, the pavilion to the yeah. elevator to the to the airport. So create, you know, it took it's taken us like 15 years to acquire the building and yeah. quiet lobbying and a lot of other uh, you know, uh, not smoke filled back rooms, but a lot of negotiations. Yeah, and yeah. now we've we've signed a 20 year lease with the city and we've raised about ten point eight million dollars towards our goal of 15 million. But, yeah, the objective is to create a, a, a you know, a jewel box on the waterfront that everyone who has an interest in a matters Irish Canadian can be proud of and can go and visit and hold events there and launch new products or, you know, have a a, a birthday celebration or a wedding celebration or whatever that might be. So yeah. then coming back to your question about my views on the Irish in Canada, well, you and I have discussed all the different aspects of it very recently. Mm -hmm. That's not just an immigration story, it's a colonial story. And it's the, the process that took place over really 300 years. Mm -hmm. And it's very rich and it's very complicated. And uh, it's it's a it's a story that's not well known in Ireland, and it's not really well known and understood in Canada. It, there's sort of ink blots of understanding, so to speak, across the landscape. But I think there's an opportunity now to link all that up together in a more cohesive way that mm. would be very educational here and in Ireland. So yeah. you know, my journey with my involvement in the community will wind down over the next few years because after 43 years, I think it's time for someone else to take it over. Well, I tell you, it's been 43 years of, of persistence, but also success. I mean, I think you've been holding the torch of this for, for a very long time. I think the other thing is the number of people that you've engaged along the way. I mean, that's, mm. that's kind of a, it's a, it's a change management process as well, because everybody then becomes more aware of the story. Uh, you've also mentioned Mark McGowan, professor at, at St. Mike's, and um, we really need to do a shout out for Mark because not only has he been a fantastic historian of the Irish in Canada, but he's been doing tremendous pioneering research on, on the famine itself <laughs> and, and the story of, of the, the, you know, 1847 in Canada. But he always, he always makes the point, which I think is a very important one, is that that was a singular year. Um, mm. that the broader story of the Irish in Canada is one of tremendous resilience and success and a, and a contribution mm. as well. Um, where Canada really comes into it is the compassion that was shown in 1847. I mean, the numbers, mm. even in Toronto, we have to get this in, in scale. You probably have the numbers at your fingertips. The, the number of Irish who arrived in 1847 looking for help in mm. a city. I mean, the city was, what, 20,000? 20,000. Yeah, I think if you Google towns and cities in Ireland, uh, which I've done, and I think, I think, I may be wrong now, of course, population numbers change. I think Nace had about 20,000 or 21,000. Yeah, so that's people. the size of Toronto in 1847. Yeah, so we... 38,500 people arrived in with typhus, for which there was no known cure. Right on top of them. I mean, yeah. it's, it's quite an astonishing uh, story of, of how the Canadians uh, responded with compassion and management, yeah. just managing yeah. that all the way along the, the St. Lawrence, you know, yeah. but yeah. In, in looking at uh, the Corlick and the famine, uh, the famine memorial part there, I mean, I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be a great hub. 
uh, it's going to be a great <laughs> platform for um, discussions about about heritage, but also mm -hmm. how we how we build a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to thank you for everything you've done over the years as well. Um, Irish Heritage Month is obviously a new development, um, thanks to James Maloney and 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 the and the Parliament in passing that. But uh, is it true to say, and and to conclude, is it true to say that you you're hopeful about? Um, the promotion of Irish heritage and awareness of that story in Canada? Well, absolutely, Eamon. I, I mean, I've said this a few times, but I would emphasize it again to anyone watching this this mm. video that uh, the best days of the Irish story in Canada lie ahead. And uh, the, the the corner of what was Bathurst Key is now Erin Key. Uh, the dock walls have had uh, basically 18 to 20 million dollars spent rebuilding them so those walls will be good for another 200 years the city is spending about 15 million dollars conserving and restoring the grain silos and they're going to look like new in a period of about six months mm. the city is also announcing a new uh, 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 spadina deck park that will cost about 120 million just east of Ireland Park on the next key over which is Spadina Key and then the area west of the grain silos and between Ireland Park and our building is going to be landscaped with a gorgeous new public space that will be will have all the benefits of Witchwood Barns the the brickworks mm. uh, uh, the distillery district but beyond the water's edge yeah. and the, the major arts and uh, heritage building will be the Corlick and yeah. so yeah. and that's the first thing people will see when they come out of the of the tunnel as i used to tell jeff wilson at the at the city of toronto at, at, uh, at ports toronto i want a sign in that tunnel that says the light at the end of this tunnel is ireland park <laughs> so <laughs> i'm personally i'm determined to get that well so. if your record is anything to go by you'll certainly get that but i do yeah. want to thank you your team led by william pete i had a fantastic tour um of the of the corlick under construction very exciting to see the space for 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 artists to create <clears throat> uh, new material there as well. And you know, the first thing we'll celebrate is the fantastic contribution of all of the board members, both past yeah. and present, because our journey here could not have happened without the support and generosity of so many people, and especially at the very early stages of the Ireland Fund of Canada as one of our founding donors. So we're always very mindful and grateful for that. And uh, similarly, of course, the government of Ireland, the government of Canada, the province of Ontario, and the city of Toronto. The city of Toronto have been generous both with treasure and with land. And yeah. when Aaron Key is finished in about two years' time, it'll be one of the most dynamic places on the waterfront. So, James, we're going to draw this to, to a close. Um, it's been great having you, great discussing um, uh, Irish heritage and this project uh, with you. Um, any closing thoughts? Yeah, just... Thank you. I mean, this is uh, we're, we're closing this this segment here, but it's it's really the beginning of something great that uh, you've started and I've been uh, honored to be part of. Uh, I look forward to hearing reactions from so many people who get to hear these stories, add to the stories and build on what we're doing. But it's a tremendous initiative. Here we are at the beginning of Irish Heritage Month, and uh, it's a very exciting time uh, to be Irish Canadian. That's right. Yeah. Thanks, James. And thanks again for all your support and leadership, including um, your fellow MPs in the Canadian Ireland Parliamentary Friendship Group. I know that's going to go from strength to strength. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to uh, keep an eye out every day. There's going to be uh, a new profile um, published um, so you can you can keep up with us uh, on our website and on our various social media platforms. Um, I think fittingly, uh, we're going to close with some Irish music. Um, happy uh, Irish Heritage Month to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Two features round, excel the lady brow, and her wrinkles can't be found in some lots. If I had a thousand pounds, I would lay the money down. The mouse comes to you, but longer. The whole of each down low, so round each to know. Our foreigners near about the thumb of
Chinchalafus, goodbye, the bronchi. Chinchalafus, goodbye. 